Welcome to church. We invite you to worship with us as we sing praises to our Heavenly Father. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His own.
Hi everyone, welcome to Sunnybank and to our online church service again. Uh, thank you for faithfully connecting in and worshipping with us as we um, try to connect certainly with each other but primarily connect with the Lord and stay in touch with Him and learn from His Word and support and encourage one another. I wonder how you're coping at this stage in the COVID-19 with all the isolation and some lifts and some things not lifting and during this time, several of our folk, church folk, have passed away, gone home to be with the Lord. Uh, we will pray for those families. Some of our folks have been in hospital, whether for an examination or whether for treatment, some very serious and uh, all are recovering and doing pretty well. Some of our folks are at home with ongoing treatment and they likewise are, are doing well and we're grateful to God for that. Um, some of our folk have family members who are overseas and of course they're unable to be able to travel to them. Um, so we want to encourage you to continue to connect with God and to connect with one another whenever you can. Send each other texts or emails or cards or it's been great to be receiving those. And I just want to bring you some announcements to update you. You would have received the bulletin and all the associated information but just to highlight um, our youth groups have returned and they're meeting fortnightly, boys one week, girls another week, just because of the COVID number, numbers and uh, it's terrific that they're able to recommence again. Some connect groups are meeting at the church property. If you would like to do that, then contact Pete in the office and he'll direct you on what you need to do. You would have received in your bulletin and in a uh, mail out the information for a special members meeting, which is coming up on the 28th of June, 1.30. It's going to be a virtual meeting. So you've got the details of how you will need to connect in, of sign in and log in. And uh, There's also a way for us to be voting. We need to vote on the budget and we need to vote on electing Tom Chow to reappoint him to being an elder. So that has a few issues associated with it. So read the material carefully and we'll work that through together. And finally, thank you for those of you who are continue to give very faithfully and especially over the last three weeks or so we've asked you to give above and beyond for our missions and that's gone extremely well you've been very generous and may God bless you and may God bless the work of our missions there are our announcements and uh, I commend the bulletin and the material to you read it carefully thank you Hi church family, just an extra special announcement on top of any other announcements that might be happening. Just to let you know that because next week on the 28th we have a special members meeting on the, uh, at 1.30pm and we have to do that online because the corona restrictions are still involved. We've taken some advice on how best to do that and we're going to do it through an app called Microsoft Teams that you can get on your phone, on your Android or your Apple phone. You can use it on your desktop computer uh, and we really encourage you to get that to be part of this meeting. Uh, and if you have any uh, curiosity at all about how that'll work, uh, about how to make that happen. Then after each of our services happening today, we have a, a sort of a test session where you can log in using that app um, and you, we can try and work at any kinks if you have any questions about how to, to effectively vote during that, how to, uh, how to make your voice heard. Uh, and so we'll be standing by to help you out during that time. So please avail yourself of one of those opportunities. Um, yeah, and, and be a part of this. We really need our members to be able to meet and gather and vote. It's an important meeting and that's how we're going to do it. So be a part of that. Uh, if you have any questions, come along and do that. There's details in the bulletin about the app as well and about the special members meeting to come. And so we look forward to seeing you participate. If you have any questions at all, of course, email the office and they'll bounce it to the pastoral team. We would love that. And uh, thank you so much for listening.
Double times it's you I see I put you first, that's all I need I humble all I am, all to you One way, Jesus You're the only one that I could live for One way, Jesus You're the only one that I could live for You're the only one Hey guys, Pastor Brem with you again this week, bringing another story for the kids, another gospel message for all your families. And you know, we've been through the start of the Gospel of Luke now, and we know in the Gospels there's a fair bit of story about the birth of Jesus, about the Christmas story, about baby Jesus. And then there's a whole lot of stuff to talk about, about the adult Jesus when he's fully grown, and how he lives his life there, and the ministry he brings. But there's not a lot about in between, about young Jesus, about the child Jesus, but there is one story that we get about Jesus when he was just a kid. And that story comes in the Gospel of Luke, and that's where we are today. So let's listen to that story together. The story of the time that Jesus got lost. Or maybe it's more like the story of the time that Jesus' parents lost him. Every year, Mary and Joseph, along with many other people, traveled to Jerusalem to worship God at the temple. In the Bible, we read what happened on one of these trips. It was when Jesus was 12 years old. He went with his neighbors and his parents, Joseph and Mary, to the temple at Jerusalem, just as they did every year. And when he got to Jerusalem, Jesus went to the temple. He started asking questions, talking about God with the wise old teachers. Jesus listened to them teaching and he asked them questions too, and they were amazed how much this boy understood. He understood everything in the Bible. And when it was time to go home, all the families went together, Mary and Joseph, well, they thought Jesus was walking with some of his friends. After a while, they went to find Jesus, but no one had seen him all day. He must have been left behind, Joseph said, and they hurried back to look for him. 
They searched for a long time, and they found Jesus in the temple. Didn't you know I was going to be in my father's house? Jesus said. He went straight home with them. Jesus always listened to his parents and obeyed them, and Mary never forgot how much Jesus loved God's word, even when he was a little boy. It's pretty amazing that when Jesus was just a boy, he knew so much, and he could study at the temple with the temple elders and the, the people who were there. And it's easy to say, well, he's the son of God, obviously. He knows all that stuff automatically. But maybe that's not exactly how we should look at it. I mean, we don't get a story about Jesus popping up from the cradle and immediately speaking the language and starting his ministry when he's six weeks old. He had to learn. He had to learn how to speak and how to walk like everyone else. Seems like he probably had to learn how to read the scriptures and understand them like everyone else. Even in this passage, we see him asking questions and engaging with people and discussing and learning. It seems less like that he knew these things because he was the Son of God, but that he knew he should learn these things because he was the Son of God. He knew who he was, and so he learned to be that. And you know, we know who we are as well. We are the children of God. Because Jesus died and rose again, we get to be called the sons and daughters of God. And that means the scripture should be important to us as well. And we should devote a lot of our time to learning about that as well, to understanding, to becoming better, uh, more uh, clever, more insightful, to know those scriptures better, to have them locked up in our memory, to be better sons and daughters of God like that. And that's what I want to encourage you guys and girls to do as well, to spend that time to take it seriously, to remember that, like Jesus, you're going to grow up and you're going to be someone who has a ministry in the world for God. So lean into it. Learn about it. If you have questions, feel free to send them to me. I would be delighted to answer them uh, in a video like this next time. Uh, so particularly if you have uh, questions about the stories we're talking about. Hey, send them in. I would love to answer them. But for now, I just want to bless you guys and honor you guys and say, you know, Jesus, he knew who he was. And so he learned the scriptures. He learned the things that were important. You guys are sons and daughters of God. These scriptures are important to you too. So learn them. Ask the Holy Spirit for help, and you can't go wrong. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for all these boys and girls. I thank you that you've made them sons and daughters of God. And I pray that you help them. I pray that you assist them in learning, that you give them a fire in their heart to encourage them to learn more. I pray that they'll get to, uh, to ask questions and show their understanding of Scripture so much that it astonishes the grown-ups around them. We want them to grow up in the example of your son Jesus growing up as well. We pray that you put the scriptures in their hearts and equip them for the ministry and the destiny you've given each of them. And we pray that in the name of your son Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks so much, guys. Glad you could be here. If you have any art or craft you want to make about this, uh, this scene we talked about today, then send that in as per normal. Also, if you have any questions about the passage, uh, if you want them answered next week, send them in. And I would be delighted to give you some answers and to help you learn and grow and embrace those scriptures. God bless you guys and God bless your families. See you next week. Let's continue our service and I'm taking the opportunity and to ask you to bow with me and let's pray together. Let's come before the Lord and seek his face and his will in our world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we acknowledge that you are the true and living God, that you're the one who is in control of what goes on in our world and in our lives. You're fully aware of each one of us and of our needs. And we ask this morning, Lord, that you would uh, continue to enable and to motivate us to connect with you, to have fellowship with you on a daily, regular basis, that our life centers around you and so help us, Lord, to develop that relationship and likewise help us to hear from you, to receive your guidance and direction as we read your word, as we listen to your spirit prompting us, as we listen to others who have input into our lives. Lord, lead us, direct us, direct us in your ways to the doing of your will. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you might be pleased to bring forth spiritual fruit in our lives. We know that pleases you and glorifies you. And therefore we ask for it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, we do pray for our world, a world which is 
not just affected by COVID-19, but a world which is filled with injustice um, and cruelty and foolishness of bad decisions being made, which has consequences and which hurts people and takes lives. We pray for the leaders of our world that you'll give them wisdom, that you'll give them courage to stand up and to do the right thing, that you'll give them discernment and that they might have a motivation, a desire to make decisions which are pleasing to you but beneficial to the people. Lord, guide our governments that they might create for us a world of peace. We pray for especially the issue of racial disharmony and ask that you would help us as your followers, your people, to model reconciliation and to model reaching out and accepting everybody as important and as equal in your sight for all made in your image and the Lord Jesus died for all. Thank you, Lord, for our missionaries and we pray that you will sustain them and empower them in their cross-cultural work. Thank you for our chaplains and for their work in our schools. And we pray that you would sustain them and energize them and give them great joy in serving you. So Heavenly Father, we bring these, our needs, before you, asking for your will to be done and for your son to be glorified. We pray in his name. And everybody said, Amen. Today's Bible reading comes from Haggai chapter 1, verses 2 to 12. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house, 
so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labour of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Hi everyone. Uh, we've come a long way through this journey through the Minor Prophets, and we're nearing the end of that journey. Now we're in the third last book of the Minor Prophets, the third last book of the Old Testament, and the book is Haggai, um, or Haggai perhaps. Yeah, I'll say it both ways. Um, but Haggai is among the last of the prophets chronologically too in the story of God's people leading up uh, to the end of the Old Testament. He's operating during the return from exile, um, the time in which the Jews were coming out of captivity in Babylon after the rise of Persia, after the Persian Empire jumped up. They're heading back to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding. So if you've tuned into the evening services uh, during the Nehemiah series, this will be especially um, interesting to you because it sort of dovetails in to that story that you've just so recently heard. And if you haven't, well then, when you do get around to studying the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which you should, uh, and they're interesting to read, uh, then Haggai is going to be a small part of that story as well. So let's get into the text right after we pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word, and we pray that you open it to our hearts as you open our hearts to it. And we pray that in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's historically orient ourselves uh, for a moment. So Babylon smashes through Jerusalem and demolishes its temple in 587 BC. The nation of Judah is scattered and in large part killed and dragged off into captivity by Babylon. Babylon flourishes for another 50 years or so until the Persian Empire next door kind of grows ascendant, bigger than they can deal with. And the book of Daniel tells of the day when the finger of God wrote in the court of the king of Babylon that you have been weighed and measured and found wanting. And shortly after this, Babylon is overtaken and, uh, by the allied integrated kingdoms of Persia and their sort of smaller ally, the Media, uh, that's the Persians and the Medes, led by Cyrus and Darius, these two kings respectively. And Babylon falls. Babylon gets slapped up. And after nearly two years uh, have passed, then the Persians, uh, they're reigning over this conquered Babylon area, the king of Persia, uh, Cyrus. He's legendarily kind to these other people groups that the Babylonians have conquered. He allows them to return to Jerusalem uh, in these waves of resettlement. Uh, Babylon falls in 538 BC and then 539 BC um, after those sort of two years of elapsed, and the Jews are allowed to begin returning to the promised land. They're led by a priest called Joshua and a governor, the descendant of King David, and therefore entitled to the kingship of Judah, a guy called Zerubbabel, uh, which is another fun name as we get in these periods of time. Um, this is a momentous and it's a wonderful blessing that they can return to the city of David with a descendant of David and a remnant of God's priesthood as well to restore the temple. So the Jews head back and they start rebuilding. They start rebuilding their homes. Uh, and this is about when the, the book of Ezra um, kicks in. It starts to mention what's going on if you're reading the book of Ezra. The Jews rebuild their altar, and so they can do burnt offerings again. They can start doing offerings to God. They can restore some of their rituals, some of their festivities. Uh, and they lay the foundations to rebuild the temple. This all happens in rapid succession, all in 539 BC. So, um, so, five, so 539 BC, Babylon falls, 538, Zerubbabel and Joshua lead the people home. 537, the altar is restored, sacrifices begin again, temple foundation built, and then things slow right down over in Jerusalem. People focus on rebuilding their farms and their homes for a while. Uh, they stop working on the temple. But in the background, in the ancient Near East, all kinds of stuff's going on, it's getting a little bit nuts out there. 
Cyrus the Great, this sort of respected conqueror um, who's kind to the, the various people groups under him, he dies. He's either killed in battle by a foreign queen who refused to marry him, or alternatively, he is killed in his house by that queen after she married him, depending on who you read telling the account of that story. Uh, Cyrus dies. He's succeeded by either his son or an imposter pretending to be that son. Either way, his old co-king Darius claims that it's an imposter, dukes it out with that guy for a little while, kills him off, and becomes the sole ruler and empire and emperor of the Persian Empire. He's Darius the Great. And people don't like him as much as they liked Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus was reasonably respected, um, for example, in letting the Jews go back to Israel, letting them to start to rebuild their temple. This was something Cyrus allowed. The historian Herodotus records that the Babylonians rebelled multiple times against Darius. They did not like him at all, and they fought back. And Darius has to head back to his homeland of Medea to, to put down a rebellion against a rebel king there called uh, Freortes. Ooh, that's one one. Uh, Freortes is the rebel king in Medea, and Darius has to go back and knock him down a peg. And while he's gone, this cunning monster named Araka, sometimes called Nebuchadnezzar IV, uh, is planning a rebellion in Babylon. Okay, so this isn't your grandfather's Nebuchadnezzar whom God uplifted and made soft-hearted and everything like that. This guy's a psycho. Uh, he prepares his forces in secret to seize the city while Darius is away, and uh, when he does, Araka decides he needs to prepare for Darius to siege the city, and so they need to lower their food consumption as much as possible. And all the men in the city are armed to fight. All the women are herded together, uh, and most of them are killed just to reduce the number of mouths to feed during the siege they're predicting. Uh, every man gets to exempt his mother and one woman of his choice to bake his bread. So don't feel too bad when these guys lose. Uh, they hold Darius outside the walls for a while. They mock and they jeer. They tell him you're never getting in. And there's a legend of this Persian general called Zopirus, uh, or Zopirus, and that's the guy that makes this conquest possible, if this legend is to be believed anyway. Uh, it said he cuts off his own nose and ears, and then he goes to the Babylonians saying that, oh, Darius the Mede, he's mutilated me, uh, and I've come to Babylon to get revenge on him. And the Babylonians, they see this man of rank, of military station, who's been so badly wronged, and they think, well, this is a resource for us to use. They buy his story hook, line, and sinker, and then they put him in charge of the army, and he marches that army straight into a Persian ambush. Uh, because who would think for a second a guy would cut off his own nose and ears to pull off a ruse like this? That's not a story in the biblical record. I just think it's a fun, gross story and good to know. Either way, this rebellion and conquest takes place 15 years after Zerubbabel and Joshua lead this wave of people home. And they must be looking back thinking, we're glad we got out of Babylon when we did. So Babylon falls again. Darius assumes direct control of the empire, becomes the emperor. Uh, and this is 16 years after the Jews have come home. Darius solidifies his rule. Two years after that, the book of Haggai begins. That's where we are in time. Uh, we've gone through this period of, of danger and, and mayhem in the main empire. During this time, the Jews have been quietly off in their little slice of the world trying to rebuild everything they have. Haggai's main concern is the temple, and that's what he writes about in his book. In the first year after returning, the Hebrews rebuilt the foundation of the temple, they rebuilt the altar, um, but then they stopped. Then they started focusing on their own things, on building up their homes, their farms, their lives. And times have become pretty lean for them. Harvests were thin, money was scarce, they had droughts that wiped out their farming efforts. And Haggai speaks God's words to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. And if you, uh, well, then you get our reading for today, the thrust of which is, you haven't bothered to honor the house of the Lord. Why would you expect the Lord to honor your house? You spent 70 years in Babylon saying, uh, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land, lamenting the loss of Jerusalem and its temple, and you haven't even rebuilt it now that you've been here for 18 years. Get your people off the couch, get them up into the mountains, cut down some trees, bring them down, start rebuilding the temple. That's what God is telling Zerubbabel to do. That's God's call for these exiles who have returned to Zion. And Haggai has two chapters. And chapter one is this call of Haggai to Zerubbabel uh, and his response in leading the people to fear the Lord again. Uh, and God's response comes in the last few chapters, the last few verses of that chapter, I should say. 
in starting at verse 13. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and they began to work on the house of the Lord, the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. That's an encouraging start. But Haggai, as God's servant, is dealing with this reluctant people. Um, They're a little uncertain and things don't seem to be turning out quite how they had hoped. They need encouragement. They need guidance as this process goes forth. They need to be able to lean on him and know that he's connected to God. And so about a month later, we get chapter 2. And we read in that whole chapter uh, the response to this attitude of the people and what the encouragement that they get from God is. And we'll read that in, in portions here. There's kind of three main sections. The first is, chapter, is verses 1 to 9 in chapter 2, and it goes like this. In the second year of King Darius, on the, first, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while... I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. So the temple will take three years to rebuild in total. And the book of Haggai doesn't last that long. The book of Haggai sort of goes through a couple of months at the beginning of the building of the temple. The first temple took seven years to build. This one takes three years to build. And the first one was done with the finest resources, the finest craftsmen, uh, all the best stuff in the ancient world. It was a wonder of construction and art. And now they have this scaffolding up for this replacement temple and it's smaller and less impressive, and it's just sort of the best they can manage with the skills and the resources they have. And they figure, it's fine, I guess. It's all right. There's a couple of old men who remember the old temple, because that was 70 years ago. There must have been children at that time uh, seeing that temple, and they see this new temple, and they think this is not very good. This is not a very good temple compared to the one that we had. But God gives his promise to Zerubbabel and Joshua. He says, be strong, I am with you. This is the covenant that I gave you when you came out of Egypt. Obviously, Joshua and Zerubbabel have never been to Egypt. uh, But when God speaks to his people like this, he's speaking to the leaders as a personification of the entire people of Israel. He's talking to his people through time. The individuals themselves are not quite so important. And remember that too. God promises an interesting thing then in verses 6 to 9. He's going to shake the heavens and the earth. And what is desired by the nations will come and fill the house with glory, and its glory will be greater than the old temple ever was. Now, this could mean two things. It could mean one thing, it could mean the other thing, or it could mean both. Because God would like that, sometimes it pays off twice. The picture God paints here is as if he's going to take the world with its empires like Assyria and Babylon and Persia that have been running amok for so long, that have plundered the temple and Israel, and he's going to turn this whole thing upside down. He's going to shake it until all the treasure falls out, uh, falls out and just pours down into the temple and fills it up. And everything else, all the wealth comes pouring out into this house of God. And God will shake the world and the Gentile nations will bring their offerings to the temple of God is the idea. This is a vision of Zion as the place where the people of God dwell and the nations come to know God through the people of God. It's very much like the vision of other prophets like Isaiah that we get of the ultimate state of what Israel was meant to be. It's cool, it's visually powerful, 
It also did not happen. Uh, not like that, at least. The temple, which was supposed to be filled with all the treasure of the nations, got demolished by the Romans in 70 AD. So, time's up on that one. However, the message of Haggai and the prophets is very much that God blesses the obedient and chastises the disobedient and withdraws his blessings from them. So, perhaps the disobedience of the Jewish people was sufficient that God withdrew that blessing at the time. But there's also this second meaning. If you cast forward in time to the day when Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to this temple, to this temple, the one they're building now, they bring him there for dedication. There's an old man there called Simeon, and he speaks a blessing at that time. He speaks a blessing over the baby Jesus as he prays to God. He says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revel for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. We know that the earth quakes when Jesus is slain on the cross and the curtain of the temple tears as if its blessing is just too much. It's exploding outwards. The glory is too much for the temple to hold. One or both of these things is true. I leave it to you to consider. Haggai chapter 2 continues from verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or some stew, some wine, some olive oil or other food, does that become consecrated? The priest says, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, then does that become defiled? Yes, the priests reply, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not return to me, declared the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, uh, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on, I will bless you. This is a warning. This comes at a time when the Jews would be looking anxiously to the sky for rain, uh, for a new growing season to break the drought. It's kind of a warning and a blessing in one. God warns the people through Haggai that it's the attitude of their hearts that really makes the difference here. It's the attitude of their heart of God's people that makes things uh, go one way or the other as far as God is concerned. They matter more than the physical things that are offered. They had built an altar and made sacrifices for 18 years and got no blessing from God because they were spiritually sinful and negligent in their attitude towards God. They had tainted the offerings that they had given because of that. And just like the consecrated offering doesn't make anything, it touches consecrated, but unclean things have a kind of an un, a contagious uncleanness in the law. It's much easier for things to go from clean to unclean than back the other way. And God requires us, therefore, to be vigilant and obedient and devoted. That's the message he is sending to Haggai's people. He's saying that's why for this 18 year span you had no success. Now take note from now when you've really started uh, putting your nose to the grindstone and you will see the blessing that comes. God doesn't just want a series of ritual offerings uh, from, which, um, from which they could get no salvation for the first temple in the first place. They hadn't stopped giving those offerings when the first temple was demolished. And it won't save this one if they build this with the wrong attitude, it won't be worth saving. If they build this with the wrong attitude and they don't really change their hearts, then they can't really expect blessing. Nevertheless, God tells them, now that you're rebuilding this temple with the right heart, take note, remember that when you stopped being disobedient and you started obeying, and that just 
opens the way for the blessing to come. You will see this rain come. And the third part of this chapter, God speaks to Haggai again that same day. Uh, This time for Zerubbabel again directly, verses 20 to 23. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the kingdoms or shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is an interesting promise for Zerubbabel. It's messianic language. You are the one I have chosen. Uh, All the other nations will be shattered and fall at your feet. I have chosen you. It's like the promise from Ezekiel uh, in chapter 37 of that book that my servant David will be king and he will rule over the nations, uh, over Israel forever, and the nations will know that I am the Lord. It's that same kind of messianic language. But of course, Ezekiel's prophecy is symbolic. David had been dead for 500 years at that point. And the nations are coming to know, uh, if the nations are coming to know God at all, if that's going to happen, it'll be with David symbolically through one of David's descendants. And guess what happens to Zerubbabel? Because he doesn't become king ruling over Israel. The nations don't come crawling to him out of the shattered remnants of their chariots to confess that there is a God in Israel. Uh, In fact, between the day of Haggai's prophecy to this day, There have always been, at some place, Gentile nations warring with each other and failing to recognize the true God of the world. That hasn't stopped yet. The time has not yet come when all their power will be broken. That hasn't yet come to pass. And this promise, this is about the last we see of Zerubbabel. Uh, he seems to melt away into mystery between here and the end of the, of the minor prophets. Um, so, so much for this particular descendant of David and what was promised for him. And his name reappears later in the genealogy of Jesus. That's kind of where he sort of kicks back into history. So we must take the symbolic meaning over the literal one here because Zerubbabel has been chosen, but he's been chosen to be the, the shoot of the tree of David from which the Messiah Jesus will spring. He's honored that Uh, By God in that he has honored God sufficiently himself that he's going to be included in this legacy of righteousness that will produce the Messiah. And one day when the Lord returns and all the power is stripped from those nations and all those who oppose God have been humbled, all of those of us who call our Lord to be our Savior will say, here is Jesus, our brother and our Savior who made us all sons and daughters of God. But a few like David and like Solomon and like Zerubbabel will also grapple with the curious realization that this savior of us is also in a way their son, their descendant, a child of their line, the one that they lived their lives knowing that God was keeping in store to bring through them and one day to restore all the world, all the world through him. That's maybe a little better of a blessing than you get to be a king for a while and then die. Uh, so... Maybe he didn't lose too much after all. We don't know what happened to Zerubbabel. There's hints that come through in the New Testament, uh, but we're just not told. Elaborate, crazy theories like priests, uh, like the priests were assassinating him uh, in a power struggle in Israel. Uh, those exist, those theories, but they have no scriptural validation. It's more likely he just sort of lived an unremarkable life as the governor of Judah, this petty province with a crummy temple and no walls, and no strength in the region at all to speak of. And 60 years after Haggai passes, uh, and 60 years after Haggai passes him this promise, I should say, uh, God chooses to work through Nehemiah to complete this wall, to bring Jerusalem kind of back towards its former glory, at least by a few more inches. And now the meaning of this book to the Jews who read it in antiquity was pretty clear. Much like God, um, set before the people with Moses, these two paths, and he encouraged them to choose life, choose blessing over cursing. Haggai does the same thing here. God will bless you if you obey his covenant, if you stay within the bounds, 
and he will curse you if you step outside it. He's demonstrated that he will. In Babylon, where they had gone, the worship of God uh, hadn't faded. They'd kept the faith through their time in Babylon. But the faiths in these other idols they'd struggled with for so long in the Old Testament of Baal and Chemosh, all these weird regional gods, they all vanished into history. Those cults didn't really survive, at least not in Israel. Idolatry of that kind was no longer really a problem for them anymore. And that's a pretty big win, considering how much the Israelites struggled with that um, throughout their history. But in learning to keep the faith in God without their ritual places and their uh, sacred places and their, um, their festivals and their sacrifices, they had lost the sense of the sacred and the important uh, the important part of being in the sacred place, doing the ritual that God had prescribed to you. They had grasped that those were symbols that meant something, but they hadn't grasped the importance of symbols in general there, of, of partaking in this sacrament that God had given them. This is, in fact, the purpose of ritual. It's remembrance and symbolism. A husband and a wife, they mark their anniversary each year, not because it makes them more married uh, or because they would stop being married if they didn't, or because they get some kind of discrete effect from, uh, from remembering that date each year. It's because marking and remembering that covenant of man and wife is an effective tradition in keeping both man and wife appreciative of the value of that covenant. It keeps it in their mind, in their heart. The date itself has no power, but the act of honoring that date does have an effect on their hearts. The Jews had learned that the blood of goats and bulls didn't really make them clean. That wasn't really what God wanted from them. God wanted their obedience. God had let Jerusalem fall even with the burnt offerings on the altar. He just rejected those. Ultimately, they were symbolic sacrifices pointing forward to the day that Messiah would come. The sacrifices themselves have no power. They only point towards the one true sacrifice who does. But the act of honoring those sacrifices has an effect in their hearts. The same is true for us with how we worship, both our ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper, but also simpler traditions, things like standing to sing and bowing our heads to pray and attending church at all. God is infinite and personal, and he does not require us to perform outward actions to know us and to forgive us when, he call, uh, when we call his son our savior. But honoring these things, and by that I mean fundamentally taking church life seriously, honoring these things has an effect on our hearts. You show me a Christian who only bothers to come along when their favorite pastor is preaching or if there's nothing else on that night, and I will show you someone who is drifting away from God because they do not take their faith seriously. And that failure to, as Haggai repeats, give careful thought to what they are doing in part, uh, in being part of God's people and celebrating him in this way, their failure to do that will taint their efforts to try and build their part of the kingdom of God. If you are not serious in how you engage with God, why would you expect to grow seriously in a relationship with him? How seriously do you take your faith? Not measured in stickers on the car or anything like that, but how do you engage with church, especially in light of the, uh, the way that we have to do church right now, the somewhat freeing and easy version of church that we have, online church? Is it serious enough for you to get out of your pajamas before you come to church? Uh, serious enough to be taking notes and not eating breakfast during church? Serious enough to make sure that next time we have communion, you actually have the bread and juice for communion and not jats and a Bundaberg sparkling apple? To have your Bible with you during the service, maybe. To not be texting on your phone or playing a game in the other monitor on the PC. Otherwise, treating church as a podcastable sermon rather than a time once a week when we gather as God's people, at least in as much as we can. Your salvation has been accomplished by God through His Son, Jesus Christ. If you call Him your Lord and Savior, nothing can separate you from His forgiveness. But as far as our sanctification goes, our becoming better and better as Christians, becoming more and more like the people God intends us to be, we're still shackled to the neutral grain rule of life. You only get out what you put in. 
or actually it's in fact much better than that, a much more generous rule. You get out a multiplied result of what you put in because you're not working alone through your own efforts. You're becoming sanctified with the Holy Spirit working with you, working alongside you, guiding and encouraging you. But you do need to put in. And part of that is what we do here. Because we don't have a house of God like the Jews did. So we don't need to worry about tainting a physical building in that way with our lazy, detached motives whenever we have them. But we are part of the kingdom of God. And when we build up the kingdom of God in any way, we honor the Father when we attend church rather than just going to church or tuning into church. If we want God to bless us as we strive to contribute to his kingdom in the manner for which he put us on this earth, especially if you felt recently disconnected and ineffective as a believer, the cure may be just as simple as this. Consider carefully the thing that you are doing, who you were before, who you serve now. Treat the work of God in your life with the reverence it deserves and watch and see how he opens his blessings on you. Let's pray together. Father God, it's easy, especially in a time where we are so physically disconnected to feel spiritually disconnected as well. But help us not to become lazy or spiritually numb. Your spirit guides and nourishes us so we trust you to spark our hearts as we strive to engage with you, both in church and in your broader kingdom work, in a way that brings you honor. Help us not to take your blessings for granted, but help us always to remember that your son died to save us from sin and rose to save us from death. And that he is forever worthy of our most cherished and sacred praises. We offer them to you now in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. Lord, I come. I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you is more grace is found is where you are where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me you are Lord I
defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Isn't our God wonderful? He watches over us, he's at work in our world, and he has a real desire for us to take him very seriously and to develop our relationship with him. We're going to close our service and I want to pray this benediction over you. Receive it as God's blessing into your life. Let's pray. Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, our great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he continue to work in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.